Welcome to today's virtual event on AI's business impact. I'm Javier David, Managing Editor for Business and Markets at Axios. Also, welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, X, LinkedIn, and of course, Axios.com. Join the conversation today on X with at Axios, uh, and please use the hashtag Axios events. During today's event, we'll explore AI's impact on business and how leaders can ensure they're putting it to effective use as the industry continues to evolve. Our first guest is Accenture North America CEO, Manish Sharma, joining us today from Chicago. Hi, Manish. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Really delighted to be here on, on your show and talking about Gen AI, one of the most exciting topics uh, of these times. Manish, lots of companies are preemptively positioning themselves as sort of avatars of the coming AI-dominated future. Uh, some of this is hype, uh, but this technology is clearly uh, poised to be very disruptive. How does the average person and the average business really uh, separate kind of the sizzle from the stake? So I think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I think a uh, couple of points I'll make. I know we we are uh, having a number of initiatives coming, whether it was blockchain, metaverse, and now it is coming on Gen AI. So there is a hype cycle around everything. I think the one thing which I want to kind of mention is that this is not a hype. This one is absolutely real. And it is going to make a dramatic change in the way we operate. And we, every single job which is out there is going to change because of Gen AI. So I think it will be a mistake to think that this is going to be a, a normal uh, hype cycle and it will go away. No, I think this is going to make AI accessible and I think it is going to change every single job which is out there. That's actually a great point because it brings me to one of my burning questions, which is, you know, in the years past, much of the conversation uh, surrounding automation is centered around manual lower wage jobs being replaced by robots. Um, but the whole chat GPT generative AI conversation has made it pretty clear that white collar, higher wage jobs, and as you say, just about every sort of employment that you can think of is set to be touched by this. Um, so how should the workforce, both blue collar and white collar, uh, kind of think about future-proofing um, themselves in this sort of seemingly unstoppable wave. So uh, uh, I will give you one comment, right? You know, and the comment which was, uh, and I will ask you a question after that. This automation will destroy all jobs across the world. When was this statement you think was made? Um, I would say. I'll say 1996, the sort of beginning of the internet. It, it was made at the time of industrial revolution in the 1870s. You know, and I think we should, it's always good to connect back to this, uh, all the you know fear and the scare that kind of go there. For us, and I think I personally believe in this, right? It creates new opportunities. It creates new jobs. It takes us to new frontiers where we have not been able to touch. We have had this automation going on. Even the RPA has been going on, machine learning, deep learning, AI has been there. This creates new kinds of jobs. And I think the question, the key thing is, how does one reskill oneself so that they can kind of move on to the next frontier, which is available to all the people, right? So I personally believe that this will create a new wave of jobs while it will continue to enhance the productivity that we are currently having, which is there is absolutely no doubt on that. I, we believe that 40% of the working hours across industries will be impacted by uh, large langu uh, language models. Gen AI will impact every job, every business, and every industry. And I think you know we did a Pulse survey and 98% of the global executives agree that the AI foundation models will play an important role in their organization strategies, right? And I think we have done uh, Accenture research, almost, uh, uh, I, I would say, what, uh, I'm trying to get to the number 900 jobs across industry. You know, I think we could create some six to eight trillion in global economic value because of this is our, uh, you know, uh, right now going in position, Javier. 
And what you've just described is something kind of some economists call creative destruction, right? Which is new industries coming along, reshaping, wiping out the old and sort of redesigning the new. Um, in some instances, some would argue that in the current environment we have, we have sort of a skills mismatch, like employers are looking for employees with a certain set of skills um, that they may or may not have. So how will AI, I mean, will AI sort of increase that gap? So I think if you really look at AI, right, and if you are able to adopt it in the right way, it will help us do our jobs much better. It will improve the quality. It will reduce the lead times. It will improve the compliance. So you have a, a very strong narrative where it will actually help us in all our jobs. And that is, I think, the key thing that we need to understand. So it will actually give us productivity tools which will turbocharge you know, how we operate and how we respond to a customer. I think that's kind of the key thing for all of us. Uh, you know, and want to just kind of give a bit of perspective on this, right? Because in Accenture, I think we have been working on this in, in a big way, right? We are right now our own best credentials. So we are actually using this, uh, you know, and we will help our clients to go further, faster with our new AI navigator for enterprise. We have built a platform which will guide the AI strategy, the use cases, the rigorous business cases, the decision making and the responsible policies, right? We are also like, I think uh, we have uh, till now, we have got 1,450 AI related patents and there are patents pending in this, right? A, a patent that uses machine learning models to identify new uses for molecules in pharmaceuticals and using AI to generate product design. So that's kind of how we are the how the work the in kind of the work that we are doing it is changing, right? And when you talked about the reskilling on this, we are investing three billion dollars in data and AI through doubling our AI talent to eighty thousand professionals through a mix of hiring, acquisitions, and training, right? And we have added thousands of specialized practitioners through acquisitions of 27 companies with skills in areas such as digital sciences, AI algorithm development, and data engineering. So you can kind of just see, right, that what we are doing in terms of just changing the gap. And last one that I do want to kind of mention here is Accenture is launching Gen AI Studios in Chicago, in Houston, in New York, in San Francisco, in Toronto and in Washington, DC. The results we expect from the studios, because it is again linked to the question that you're saying, right? I will get clients to come in and reinvent processes and operate in new ways. We will sit down in the, uh, uh, in the studios. We will reimagine the work and the talent. We will get the data and the infrastructure ready and we will responsibly develop new gen AI applications as well as manage and improve them. This studios will also help us to become better equipped to differentiate themselves by offering innovative AI fueled products and services. So that's kind of, you know, uh, just the way we are approaching this, trying to get reskilling done, getting 80,000 80, people completely trained on this, and getting the clients to come and, and, and learn with us. So it's clear, I, early on at least, it's clear that AI can perform certain tasks but not others. Uh, we're not yet at the stage yet where an algo can write an entire movie TV script or represent someone in court or you know even interview a CEO. Um, so how does the industry ma or industries maximize uh, the use of AI uh, without ratcheting up expectations too far, but also do is what you uh, just clearly put, uh, help us do our jobs better and in a way that's more efficient and productive. So I will, I will kind of illustrate on this that how real it is. And I will illustrate with few Gen AI use cases. Uh, and I'll give you some examples, right? So let me start with finance executives. Finance executives can use Gen AI to leverage data and in industry insights to report in plain English. 
it will just test it all the data that is there in plain English. They can use Gen AI to leverage data and take industry insights. A customer service person can use Gen AI to provide recommendations as well as capture notes after a call. And you can see a lot of this co pilot It's all real. I, even most of my calls, I, I put up my uh, uh, co-pilot and I say, give me the transcript. It gives me the transcript of the discussion. Third one, in the oil and gas industry, safety is paramount. With workers operating heavy equipment and working with flammable materials, we are working with one company to put more clinical data on the front line, critical data, uh, sorry, uh, to on the front line to increase the safety. Then I'll give an example of uh, a, of a bank, we are working with a bank with an abundance of customer data, putting that data, that insight right into the banker's hands, enables them to cross sell products and services like mortgages or home equity uh, 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 loans uh, more efficiently. Why? Because now they have more insights into their customer needs. Give an example of a manufacturer. A manufacturer can maximize machine life cycles by improving maintenance and reliability. People can use it to draft precise maintenance job plans. And you know how difficult the maintenance job plans are, right? The forecasting when updates are required and are scheduling them. This not only reduces the number of hours people spend analyzing data, but it, what it also does is it helps avoid costly breakdowns. I'll give you some more manufacturing examples. It, it helps us in addressing the cybersecurity challenges. Many aging facilities have equipment that is vulnerable to cyber attacks. A robust AI-driven sensing mechanism for cybersecurity in facilities can help plants become more secure. It improves, it helps us improve energy consumption. AI can process data from sensors on equipment and other sources to identify the patterns and propose optimized energy usage plans. And then, you know, the best example, you know, I always love this one is around minimizing the supply chain disruptions. AI can automatically scan the news for stories that might impact the suppliers, which can trigger operations managers to create automated alerts as well as replan and schedule the actions to handle risk management. But that's kind of just, you know, the power of this and how it can impact in every single job in every single industry, right? Uh, I, I, I can give more examples, but, uh, you know, I'm taking a, a bit of a pause here. Um, Mesh, that was um, very comprehensive and uh, really great and an absolutely fascinating conversation. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thanks, Avia, for the opportunity here. And it is an exciting area. And I will welcome everybody to join, uh, you know, our, our studios and kind of to get, gain a first-hand experience of what we are doing here. Thanks again. And next, we have a view from the top segment with Mia Valo. Thank you, Javier. And thank you to our sponsor, Meta, for making this conversation possible. Now joining us today is Meta's Vice President, Head of Online Sales, Operations and Partnerships, Justin Osofsky. Hey, Justin, welcome to Axios. Hi there, it's great to be here. We're here today to talk about AI and its impact across business. We've all seen the absolute boom of AI, and we know it's already having a huge impact on businesses, everything from everyday operations to long-term strategies. So Justin, as we dive in, let's do some scene setting. First, can you tell us about AI at Meta? What is its current role and what do you think is coming next? This has certainly been a breakout year for AI across the industry, but at, at Meta, it's, it's nothing new for us. We've been investing in AI for many years now. If, if you think back to the earliest days of Newsfeed, where we were using ranking systems to power things, and we've also been investing a lot in our ads products and how AI can power advertising campaigns. Now, in 2022, we consolidated this under the Advantage Plus umbrella, where with products like the Advantage Plus shopping campaigns. And in 2023, 
we're really seeing a lot of these investments come to fruition, that we think this is really going to be the first AI powered holidays with both where AI is playing important roles for both businesses as well as for consumers. All right. So it sounds like we're heading into the AI holiday season. I'm definitely looking forward to see what happens. We all know, of course, that AI and generative AI have taken the industry absolutely by storm. Many are referring to this moment as an AI revolution. Justin, as you've hinted, we're seeing lots of new tools introduced into the market, including tools from Meta. So tell us, what has Meta launched for businesses recently and how did those launches come about? Sure. So we've been working hard to figure out how AI can improve the ROI that advertisers get. And at this point, nearly every advertiser uses at least one AI tool. Now we've recently been rolling out new tools. So for instance, in Ads Manager, we've rolled out the ability to use image expansion, text variation, and background generation. And these are based on some of the learnings for, we earlier did in, in our sandbox testing. I think we're seeing, we're seeing the early use of these show real results. For example, Publicis has used a kind of background generation to show multiple variations of their background for one client. And, and that's just one example. And in terms of what's next, as Mark, as Mark Zuckerberg alluded to, we're testing experiences for, for customer service and support. So imagine you can enable a small business to deliver great customer service experiences in a way that it would traditionally take a lot more resource and be a larger company. And so we're working on that as well. And we're excited about what's ahead. That's great. Thank you for sharing these really interesting use cases. So we're talking about advertisers here and the tools that they're using. And I imagine that in your role as head of sales and partnerships, you hear a lot from advertisers. So can you tell us some of the feedback that those advertisers are sharing with you? Sure. Well, we strive to be the best minute and best dollar for advertisers. We want to make sure that you use your time really well and get the results you want. And what I've been hearing from advertisers, as I've been talking with hundreds of small businesses, is first and foremost, to focus on return on investment. ROI. And, and, you know, what's interesting is for companies that have been using the Advanced Plus shopping campaigns, they're seeing quite meaningful results. One story, study showed that it improved cost per acquisition by 17% and return on ad spend by 32%. But this isn't just an aggregate. When you, when you look at what individual customers are, are, are seeing, Air France, for instance, saw two times the conversion relative to business as usual using Advantage Plus shopping. And one really interesting company built basics. They produce athleisure wear for men. They're based out in Southern California. They use Advantage Plus shopping, which came up with a different targeting approach. It started targeting women and found that a lot of women purchase on behalf of the men in their lives. And from there, they got a really interesting insight on how to evolve their campaign. A second thing I'm hearing is how to find new customers. And here it's about testing and learning and, and doing that fast. And finally, it, it's, it's about getting real feedback. And our advertisers in the AI sandbox, they told us that they expect the gen AI, generative AI to, to save them, you know, five hours a month that they can better spend with customers. And I think that's awesome. And when you think about that for a small business, that's really meaningful. That's time you can spend with your customers. Those results are amazing. I'm sure there are other marketers watching who love the little peek under the hood and would love to take advantage of those real world use cases. And you shared with me that your role at Meta has shifted to focusing on small and medium-sized businesses. I wonder, as you've settled into that role and work with those partners, what are you seeing as the greatest AI opportunity that small and medium businesses can start to mobilize? I think two things really matter here. First is to lean into automation. And by the way, automation can look very different for different SMBs. If you're an e-commerce company, the Advantage Plus shopping solution can be a really powerful tool. For instance, Stringjoy, which is a guitar company that produces guitar strings, saw a 12% reduction in CPAs relative to business as usual using Advantage Plus Shopping. But different types of advertisers will use different tools. If, if you're a professional services company, you can use AI to help with lead generation. And I think in that way, drive your business forward. The second thing that I hear frequently is the notion that creative is the new targeting. And what AI allows you to do is really quickly iterate in using these tools in an ads manager to, to help develop new creative, to test it and see what audience it's, it most resonates with. And so those are kind of, I think, a couple of the most important opportunities for small businesses. 
Thank you. Such fascinating insights that can serve so many. And unfortunately, we're at my final question. As we look back on the last few years, the one constant is change, and no company has managed to escape that. So to wrap us up, tell us, what has change meant for Meta? What transformations have you seen over the last few years? And following up to that, what is the vision for Meta moving forward? This has been an important year of transformation for our company. And we've been investing in a lot of tools that I think lay the groundwork for the next several years ahead. At this point, you have 3.9 billion people every month using one of our apps on Meta. That obviously puts a great responsibility on us to serve these people well and create great experiences and also a real opportunity for, for advertisers to, to reach new customers and retain existing ones. But while we've talked a lot about AI in this conversation, it's not all we're focused on. You know, just to give a couple examples, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing on video and reels and the experiences those are creating, as well as our investments in business messaging. So it's an exciting time at Meta and we're excited for what's ahead. Thanks for sharing Meta's vision with us, Justin, and it is all the time that we have. Thank you so much again for joining us today at Axios. Thanks for having me. And now over to Nathan Bomi for our next segment. Thanks, Mia. Our final guest today is Harvard Business School professor Kareem Lakhani. Professor Lakhani, thanks for being with us today. Good to be with you, Nathan. You can call me Kareem. Okay, fair enough. So all right, you've said that AI won't replace humans, but humans with AI will replace humans without it. So does this mean I need to make AI my work buddy? Uh, your, yeah, your work buddy, your cognitive partner, your thought partner. Uh, it's clearly um, something that it's new for most of us because we have not had to have the super intelligent uh, research associate available to you on demand to, to do any task for you, uh, but to really think with you and push your own thinking and the AI's thinking along the way. So absolutely, that's going to make a, that's, that's the future that we see many knowledge workers heading towards. It feels like we're living, we're, we're seeing this collision of both fear and opportunity right now as it relates to yeah. AI. What will emerge from that big bang? I guess a great way to put it, the big bang. I mean, I think, I think, look, I think, I think in our studies and in what we have sort of seen uh, take place with, uh, with knowledge workers, we, we're, we're going to be in a time of transition because uh, we observe uh, in much of what I've sort of seen with executives and with leaders and with people and managers has been lots of interest in generative AI, even initial use, but actual integration with your workflow, actual integration as a thought partner is very low. Very few people actually use this tool. The ratio tends to be like 70% um, tell me uh, uh, that this is going to change my job, it's going to change my career, change my company in three years, in three years. Uh, but only 10% are actually using it every day. And the joke I make is like, are you going to like phone this in on the 35th month? Like what's the, what's the deal? Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that our mental model of how to use technology is always been like one shot, like just do the Google search and find the answer versus a cognitive thought partner that knows a lot, but makes mistakes, uh, can hallucinate, um, can, uh, can, can go after anything you want has not existed before. And so we all have to learn how to use it. Uh, and in using it, what we realize is, oh, there's a bunch of stuff I did that was like, not necessary anymore because the machines can do it way better. And that causes a bit of crisis. Like, oh, if it's good at all these things, what do I do? In one of our studies, a subject said, uh, they did a task that took them two hours without AI. And with AI, it took them 20 minutes. And their reaction was something that like really stunned me. They said, oh, this feels like junk food. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I think this opens up so many more things for you to do. But if your identity has been one of, I exert mental effort, I'm smart, I'm gonna do this, it takes me two hours, and with the machine I can do it in 20 minutes, I'm somehow devaluing myself. And that crisis is what I think many workers and many leaders and many executives are gonna go through up and down their organization. Well, do you, do you think we need like an attitude adjustment then? Is that what the average person needs? <laughs> I don't think it's, 
<laughs> you sound like like a like a communist re-education camp or something. No, not at all. Look, I think it's a matter of learning how to use this tool. Um, yeah. uh, it's kind of like you know Steve Jobs called computers the bicycle for the mind way back in the eighties, um, and I think that's a an apt term for AI. But what's here's what's happening. You, you're 20 years old, you're 30 years old, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60, you're 70. And all of a sudden, finally, the bicycle for the mind has arrived. But you don't know how to ride the bicycle. So guess what? You got to learn. And guess what? In learning how to ride a bike, if you remember the time when you learned how to ride a bike, you fell down. You got a concussion. I learned how to ride a bike when I was a kid and we didn't wear helmets. We got concussions. You got bloody elbows. You got scraped knees. It's all part of the learning process. But once you invest the time and the effort to learn how to ride the bike, you can't unlearn it. And so for me, the mandate for companies and for individuals is to invest in the learning. Invest in how to learn to use these tools. Don't be afraid of them. Use them as a booster for yourselves. And some things that you used to do won't be necessary, but now you can do more things. And having this mindset of abundance is going to be really important here. So I don't think it's yeah. re-education as much as this learning mentality and learn to use this bicycle for the mind. Well, you mentioned Steve Jobs, and that leads into my next question, which is how fast is AI going to change things? Because when I look at two major technologies over the last 50 years, the internet comes along and then maybe in the, invented in the 70s or so, but it really takes decades for it to change society. The iPhone, however, comes along in 2007, takes only a few years to change things. How quickly do you think AI is going to truly disrupt business? I think, yeah, I think the compression time is is here. Uh, the compression is happening uh, quite a bit. And the difference between the internet, you know, remember there's like 30s of the internet and then the browser gets invented, but yeah. we still had dial tone at that time. We had the boop, boop, beeps with our modems <laughs> that were that was happening for like a decade before we actually had, you know, broadband at our home. And then, and then, and then now we have broadband in our pockets with 5G systems and so forth. So, so the world has more connectivity, has more data, more expertise. So I expect the compression to be uh, quite significant, uh, even more so than the iPhone. The problem though I see is that the, the learning curve is still steep. So there'll be, a, there'll be a bunch of people that get it and will be off to, to the races. And there'll be the rest of us that'll be like, oh my God, I, I've got to spend 15, 20, 30 hours learning this tool. How am I going to do that? Like, and and who's, who am I going to go to? Uh, and so that might slow things down. But also, I think my real worry about businesses and AI is the following. If you go back to the internet days and the first uh, example uh, of a true internet application was e-commerce, right? Everybody said in the 90s, e-commerce, Pets.com, Socks.com, you, know, you name it, all of these e-commerce things came about. Um, but there was a bifurcation in, uh, let's, let's imagine in retail, right? Uh, Barnes and Noble and Borders adapted. They built e-commerce operations. They sold books online. But they fundamentally did not change their business model or their operating model and fundamentally did not bring the data and the internet to the core of their business, right? Bezos instead says, I'm also going to enter books. I'm also going to sell books through e-commerce. But what I'm building as a company is something very different. And so my worry right now is that there's lots of use cases. Everybody wants to build their own private chatbot. And, and I've done AI. The board says, do AI. CEO says, oh, I've got five chatbots. That's kind of like the e-commerce things that Barnes and Noble and Borders are going to do. And I'm worried about the Amazons of the world will show up with using AI, fundamentally rethinking their business model and the operating model. And that's going to bite a whole bunch of companies simultaneously. And so I think the, 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 the imperative for both knowledge workers, you and I working inside of organizations, but also for leaders of organizations is to actually do the strategic thinking needed. If I have this new cognitive enhancement tool, and if I think about all the places where cognitive enhancement is used in my organization, how might I rethink my organization? So I think that's going to be my, my, my biggest worry. The time is going to compress, but the, but the adoption will still take time. And we might adopt it the wrong way instead of sort of rethinking our foundations. 
when, when I think about the way that AI is going to enhance us or maybe degrade the, the average worker's productivity, I mean, there's still a debate there, of course. I wonder about the if there's a comparison to something like Google Maps. Google Maps comes along and fundamentally changes the way people get around, makes it so much easier. And yet I, a lot of people now don't even know how to get around their own neighborhood on their own. Like they just have relied on it so much. So yeah. where's the line? Where's Is there a danger that people become too reliant on AI and then we can't do things for ourselves? 100%. Look, I think, I think this is going to be the biggest topic for both uh, learning institutions like ours and teaching institutions like ours and everybody else, which is if now I have these superpowers of AI available to me to solve my problems, where do I put my own thinking? Uh, my, my postdoctoral fellow, Fabrizio Delacqua, for his doctoral dissertation at Columbia, did a study showing that people fall asleep at the wheel with AI. Uh, we've done a, a large uh, scale experiment with BCG using GPT-4, and we find great productivity benefits, but where the AI is not good, like a harm in performance. And so I think this, this question of skills atrophy, but I think fundamentally what's really cool and scary at the same time is what it means for us to think and learn is going to change with AI, and we don't have the answers yet. And that's why it seems like the big bang is going to happen yeah. and we're all going to sort of sort our way through it. Well, I don't think it's going to take billions of years for society no, to actually no. evolve here, but it, uh, it is a big bang. Well, uh, Kareem, thank you so much for joining us. That's all the time we have, but we really appreciate this conversation. Thanks, Nathan. A lot, a lot of fun. Well, we want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for another Axios event that has made everyone smarter, faster. For more coverage or to sign up for our AI Plus newsletter or my Axios Closer newsletter, visit axios.com slash newsletters. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you on axios.com.